so pleased to be able to introduce our keynote speaker for this conference, which I just have to say, this has been really fun today, right? Have we had a great time? I have learned so much, and it has been such a pleasure to have everybody here, so thank you all for being here. Um, and I love that we're having the keynote at the end. You know, sometimes you do it at the beginning and then, but now we get to wrap things up in a really wonderful way, and I'm so excited. And when we were first talking about the keynote for this conference, everyone said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could get Jarrett Drake to do it? And guess what? We did. So, <laughs> you know, we just won the lottery. Um, Jarrett Drake is, as you may know, um, a, a one-time archivist who is now a graduate student at Harvard University um, in um, uh, social anthropology, and is also an activist archivist um, working with the People's Archives of Police Violence in Cleveland. So he's worked in university contexts, both as an archivist and now as a researcher, um, but has always kept his work connected very deeply to community archives and archives that are not only about collecting people's histories, but also activating that archive for political change and social justice. So um, he is going to talk to us about this work and his title of his talk is Graveyards of Exclusion, Archives, Prisons, and the Bounds of Belonging. So please join me in welcoming Jarrett Drake to the podium. Good evening. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that uh, warm welcome. And uh, before I get started, I have a few other thanks that I want to give. Um, I want to thank the people who made this space possible, uh, who made this space so warm and welcoming, everyone who set up tables, chairs, food, water. It's so hot in here. When they pour their ice, I might ask them to pour some on me. Um, so it's very warm on this very cold, uh, crisp New York day. Um, I thank everyone who's setting up the media um, to make the, the recordings available for, for posterity. Um, everyone who coordinated the logistics of the travel. I know that takes time, it takes attention. Um, and I just want to name that and say that I see it. Um, and I want to thank Elizabeth and the rest of the uh, Scholar and Feminist Conference planning team um, for bestowing this honor upon me. And it really, it really is. I've been talking to people about how I don't really get that nervous talking in front of people, but this is the uh, exception to that. Um, I've been uh, uh, an attendee here a number of times, um, uh, accompanying my partner, Karina Barris, who's here today. So we should clap for her. Um, she's basically an archivist at this point. She's been to so many talks and conferences about archives. But with her, I've come to so many events in this very room. So um, it, it was definitely like, I thought it was a typo when I got the email that said that I would uh, be speaking at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Um, and uh, I want to uh, also uh, thank um, Monique from the last panel mentioning Monea Cass um, and uh, it, it, I, I was hearing it and I had to like do a double take because I live in Roxbury, I live right near Mount Cass Boulevard. Um, I had never heard the story um, at all. So I just think that's a testament to the power of this space to be so, uh, so connected and, and educated and surrounded by wonderful people. So thank you for uh, helping tell uh, Mount Nea Cass's story. Um, and I hope that my comments here today can um, wrap up what has uh, been a great, great conference all around. So. Um, before I actually get into the heart of my talk, um, and again, the title is Graveyards of Exclusion, Archives, Prisons, and the Bounds of Belonging, um, I wanted to give a little bit of a preface um, that explains why in the hell I'll be discussing archives and prisons uh, in the same breath, because I don't think it's that obvious of an observation. So the short answer is that over the last 10 years, I've spent the greater part of my life in either an archive or a prison um, in some capacity. So the first archive I ever worked at, uh, the Bonnicky Library at Yale, it sits just a few blocks away from the New Haven Correctional Center, um, which is a level four high security jail that incarcerates people um, who are awaiting trial or awaiting sentencing. Um, and so during the summer of 2008, I would leave from tutoring at the jail and go right into the Bonnicky to, to work. Um, fast forward four years later in 2012, I'm getting my master's in archival studies at the University of Michigan. 
Um, I chose to write a master's thesis because I like torching myself and uh, wrote a master's thesis that, that I didn't have to. Um, and I selected as my focus uh, the ways that prisons keep records of people they send to solitary confinement. Um, and I'll never forget reading about the fundamentals of records management um, while at a casino hotel in Tupelo, Mississippi, um, and then driving out to Parchman uh, uh, to the Minis Mississippi State Penitentiary to talk with prison administrators and guards about their processes for packaging people into caged boxes and storing them away for definite or indefinite sentences. Um, Fast forward for more years to 2016, and I'm a digital archivist at Princeton University by day, helping keep the modern history of a university that made its wealth in part from the labor of enslaved people. Um, by night, I was co-teaching English courses to college students who are legally enslaved at different prisons in New Jersey. So fast forward to the present, and I'm training to be a social anthropologist where, again, I'm spending a lot of time thinking and reading about archives and prisons. So I mentioned all of this to say that Prior to my preparation for this talk, I never saw any connections between my experiences in the archives and prisons. Um, I arrived at one site, the archive, to labor, and I arrived at the other site, the prison, to liberate. I separated in my mind the labor from the liberation, failing to realize that you literally can't spell the word liberation without labor. The only things that seemed obvious to me about both archives and prisons were their racialized, gendered, and class dynamics. The professional staff makeup of archives is disproportionately white, and the largest share of the labor is done by women, whereas the composition of incarcerated people is disproportionately black and poor, while the most disproportionately criminalized within that demographic of black poor people are black women, which the historian Dr. Callie Gross meticulously tracks with her scholarship. So these racialized, gendered, and class dynamics of archives and prisons should be apparent, but what's less so is what I'm about to describe today. It's been two years since I visited a prison or worked as an archivist, archivist, and this distance has given me room to read, reflect, and ruminate on the social functions that these two sites serve. More than anything, I want everyone here to know that I'm not pulling these stories out of my ass and making them up uh, as men are wont to do in these situations. Um, <laughs> And I also just want to name my gender. Um, uh, one of the other reasons why I was really nervous about accepting this is because I really don't feel like I should be up here. Um, and uh, this is not in the script, but I just had to say it and name it. And um, as I talked about in other places, I think that um, men get too much credit for saying basic shit that women say all the time. And white people get a lot of credit for shit that black people say all the time. And, so um, I just have to name it and speak on it, and uh, I don't really know what to do with it. I just want to get it out of my, out of my head for right now. Um, so <clears throat> back on script. Um, so what you're about to hear comes from engaged experiences, sensitive scenes, and lived tensions. This is not the only or the definitive way to look at the problem. It's just the way that I do so, and um, my hope is that it might open up for you some of the topics covered at this conference so far, and if I do my job right, maybe a few topics that it didn't. So, that was just a preface, I ain't even started yet. <laughs> um, so, graveyards of exclusion, archives, prisons, and the bounds of belonging. The boundaries of an archive exist equally in their fixity and their fluidity. The rarity of archival records, so goes the logic, requires that organizations that manage them to erect and enforce borders capable of communicating to potential visitors, they have inter indeed entered a separate space. Weighty doors, swipe card readers, and security guards accomplish the aim appropriately. Yet an archive must also maintain permeable perimeters in order to engender processes of knowledge creation and dissemination. An archive thus attracts potential researchers in part from its support of past researchers seeking to share findings from previous visits as the panelists uh, in the previous session illustrated. So in this way, archives teeter on attention that simultaneously must keep items in and keep certain people out, all the while ensuring a secured but steady cycle of those who enter and those who exit. This persistent but porous boundaries of archives mirrors that of another site similarly situated on the erection and enforcement of borders, prisons. Penal institutions, too, deploy procedures and practices to communicate to the incarcerated and those who visit them that they have crossed into a wholly new world. Similarly, weighty doors, 
identification card, uh, identification card verification technologies, and correctional officers patrol the perimeters of prisons. They, unlike archives, commit people within their walls against their will, but they share a dependency on the circulation of souls beyond the bars and back again. That is, prisons in the United States have released million, millions more people than they currently incarcerate at any given point in time. And this cycle is precisely the point. A prison that fails to repeat the rhythm is indeed a failure. So yet the emphasis by both archives and prisons on boundaries and the circulation of bodies does not constitute their greatest affinity. Instead, in this talk, this talk attempts to chronicle, compare, and contemplate how these two seemingly unrelated institutions in the United States converge and diverge on issues of kinship and issues of citizenship. The recent turn in archival practice towards these three social phenomena prompts a consideration of the ways in which the prison, by design of its social function, embodies their supreme severance. Both archives and prisons articulate expressions of state power, so what follows carries significance for archivists, anti-prison activists, and the small but growing contingent of thinkers and doers who labor as both, thereby envisioning their work, envisioning our work, as seminal in contesting these graveyards of exclusion in whichever form, forum, or manifest, manifestation that they take shape. So moving into archives, the term archival practice, uh, just as a preface, used in this talk, refers to the range of practices and discourse among a variety of social and uh, professional organizations that operate ostensibly to promote public access to archival records. That's kind of the, the definition that we always tell ourselves. Um, well, you all tell yourselves, I quit the field. Um, <laughs> uh, I have to catch myself, I'm sorry. Um, Examples of these organizations include the historical societies and the manuscript libraries um, organized as independent nonprofit entities funded largely by individual monetary donations. Um, and it also includes the governmental archival repositories and university special collections in which I used to work, um, organized within a larger institution and funded through a mixture of public and private funding. Um, other examples include the increasing number of initiatives intentionally established free from those constraints, again, as we saw illustrated on the previous panel, um, and the tens of thousands of groups in the United States uh, that get caught up in this broad term of archival practice. Um, it might appear to suggest that a shared focus on preserving pieces of the past is all that coheres these social spaces into a recognizable whole. However, the historical and temporary praxis of these organizations actually suggests that archives fulfill grander social functions, kinship and citizenship. Kinship, as some may know, has uh, been a long preoccupation for anthropologists uh, for decades. And rather than uh, simply a word, a substitute for the word family, kinship refers to the structural, the systemic, and symbolic elements of the relationship uh, shared amongst people who identify as kin whether that be on the basis of blood, obligation, or a mixture of both. The earliest social science studies of kinship emerged in the British mode of social anthropology, building out theories of kinship based upon the observations of so-called primitive societies, which was basically a poor euphemism for what ultimately amounted to analysis of how non-white people forged family ties. Um, the anthropological study of kinship has been critiqued from a number of scholars within and beyond the discipline, chief among them David Snyder. Schneider argued that the anthropological approach to kinship studies relied on an unstated assumption that blood is thicker than water. He called this assumption part of the ethno-epistemology of European culture, so much you get that on a shirt, um, <laughs> and concluded that anthropologists had to grapple with the whiteness of that assumption. I think we can extend Schneider's argument to archival practice and make a compelling case that in the United States anyway, the field has likewise tacitly assumed that the family is a primary social entity around which to collect, arrange, and describe a set of archival records. So to put it another way, archival praxis in the United States has a family fetish that we, rec we can recognize through three avenues. The first pertains to the emergence of archival institutions. The second relates to the reality of who currently constitutes a primary archival user base and the third is reflected in a set of technological institution instructions aimed at assisting that user base. And I'll briefly go through each of these three. So on the first point about the history of archival institutions, and my apologies if you know some of this, I know that others in this room don't, um, but many historians, literary, and archival studies scholars uh, point to the establishment of a national archives by France following the French Revolution as the dawn of archival administration. 
Um, while certainly true to an extent, this declaration doesn't account for the fact that the United States didn't have a unified national archives until the 1930s. And so it would be an inaccurate to claim that the way that the French marshaled memory in the wake of the French Revolution to foment a national identity was mirrored in the United States. Rather, the earliest archival repositories in the United States were the private historical societies and manuscript libraries of New England and the mid-Atlantic regions of the nascent nation. Their primary purpose was not to assemble an archive for the new idea of what was becoming America, nor was it to be accessible to everyone. Instead, these institutions largely collected family papers of the wealthy merchants, enslavers, and politicians who mostly funded these operations. This early emphasis on documenting family history explains why the first public archives in the US actually emerged from uh, the Deep South in places like Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, following the end of Reconstruction. Why the Deep South? I'm glad you asked. Without a reliable source of public records, champions of the lost cause would have been unable to document their lineage to Confederate soldiers to whom many Southern towns began erecting monuments and memorials at this same time in the late 1800s. So a public archive um, also allowed white Southerners to file claims for pensions owed to descendants of veterans as well as their ability to join groups such as the Sons of Confederate Veterans and the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So it would be these archival professionals from the U.S. South, um, in North Carolina in particular, in particular, who initially led the U.S. National Archives and ushered uh, the field into its present professional form. So recognition of the origins of archive making and archive building in the United States um, is important because it helps highlight how the field of archival praxis will later develop, which brings me to the second point about the field's family fetish, its primary user base. So contrary to what many archivists would like to admit, um, we don't, or I didn't, uh, spend the majority of the day helping historians uh, find the last missing link in the puzzle that they were trying to solve and later publish for prestigious university press. That's just not what happens. Um, the most consistent and persistent user base uh, of, archi of archival repositories have been genealogists. Um, this holds true regardless of um, whether the archive is a public government agency or a division of a private university's library. So for instance, uh, while I was working as a paraprofessional at the Maryland State Archives, I answered countless reference inquiries from researchers trying to locate a death certificate um, for proof of an ancestor's birthplace, which is a really um, important way for black people to trace their lineage because, of course, black people were not always uh, given birth certificates. So um, likewise, during my reference shifts at Princeton University, in the university archives, a sizable number of phone calls and emails came from people trying to look up family legends of people who maybe it went to Princeton and they were trying to confirm one way or another, probably to try to get a legacy admission, to be honest with you, but you know, <laughs> that's not in the paper, that's not going online. Uh, but um, in fact, to cope with the onslaught of these calls of people trying to do genealogical research, uh, we as reference archivists had a database that was ready to, uh, to answer all of these questions and confirm or deny these intergenerational uh, tall tales. So to reiterate, this is not to say that all types of archives uh, rely on or have a substantial usage rate by genealogists, but it is to say that a sizable share of them do. So evidence to support th that assertion brings me to the third way that archives embody a fetish on family. Through the deployment of encoded archival contexts, corporate bodies, persons, and families known to many of you or some of you as EAC, CPF. Lord, forgive me, I'm talking about this again. Um, <laughs> so because I love y'all, I'm not gonna go into details about what EAC, CPF means. You don't even need to remember that. Um, just know that it's an international standard of rules for encoding information um, about the people um, who create archival records. So to those unfamiliar, establishment of the creator of an archival collection um, is the first step in distinguishing one set of records from another set of records. Um, so it is uh, as significant in the landscape of archival practice as any other organizing principle. Um, so because it determines the scope and the contents of the records that a researcher might encounter. So EAC CPF as a standard aims to facilitate the creation of what they call authoritative records uh, about a corporation, a person, or a family, so that a researcher at an archive in Massachusetts, for instance, would be able to recognize that there are related records um, of this family uh, in Mississippi, perhaps. So, why does this matter? 
The unstated assumption behind EAC CPF is that it elevates the family as a natural, stable, and consistent corporal entity. This assumption barely holds up for white people, uh, and it certainly doesn't hold up for uh, the black, indigenous, and Latinx people who, uh, have, who have had to forge familial ties in particular forms as a way to cope with white supremacy, forced migration, mass criminalization, and invading armies. So in essence, I'm saying that to establish, uh, to establish a creator of a co collection um, around a corporation or a person is more self-evident than to establish it around a family. The records of the McDonald's Corporation or the papers of Ray Kroc cohere in a particular way than the Ray Kroc family papers would not. For a family is a messy but imprecise unit of observation. And many in this room, to be sure, are aware of, if not uh, descendants of, like I am, of the many black babies born from the rape of enslaved black women, uh, neither of whom an uh, uh, archival authority record would recognize as belonging to the family of the enslaver and entitled to the property rights and civil rights uh, contained therein. So the rights that accompany uh, membership in the family suggest a secondary role uh, of archives in the United States, which is the cultivation of a citizenry. Archives keep, among other sets of records, the constitutions, the declarations, and the sets of laws that govern a democratic society. The accessibility of the archive, so goes the rhetoric, reflects the fact that citizens have the ability to contest their grievances on the basis of documents stored at the archives. People have used archives to hold accountable states and government agencies that once authorized their abuse, uh, detention, and other forms of violence. And so it is within the archive that the subject becomes a citizen, fully aware of the benefits guaranteed in the legal system designed for her enjoyment. The degree to which archival repositories in the United States succeed at this function is independent of the fact that the professional literature and professional organizations, such as the Society of American Archivists, repeat this rhetoric, repeat this rhetoric and purport archives as one of the linchpins of a democratic and thus legitimate state. Without them, it is argued, citizens are reduced to subjects and incapable of holding those in power to account for their actions and misdeeds. In fact, when several other archivists, uh, some of whom are uh, in this room today, uh, several archivists and I co-created an archive of police violence in Cleveland, um, we soon devised a designation of citizen archivist um, to refer to the people who, responsi who are responsible for the day-to-day -day operation and control of the project, um, in contrast to ourselves, whom we called uh, advisory archivists. So uh, presumably, other adjectives would have fit the bill. We could have uh, called them community uh, archivist or resident archivist, or maybe we didn't need a, not a modifier at all. I think that, that bears uh, uh, consideration. However, our selection of the modifier citizen um, adheres to the growing expectation that archives in democratic states exist as a form of protection against a violent, tyrannical, and discriminatory state. So the significant takeaway is that the means of archival repository, of archival repositories, collecting and providing access to archival records must not obscure the social ends of archival repositories. Surely there are other ends, such as holding collective memory, a task shared with libraries and museums. But it's been my point to demonstrate the centrality of kinship and citizenship to archival practice and in doing so highlight their contingencies and inconsistencies. Family members are not born, uh, but instead they must be made and they must be remade. And archives are a hidden terrain um, in a much larger battlefield of belonging. So in the United States, the institution of the prison functions as a foil to this battlefield of belonging. By prison, I refer not only to the carceral facilities named as such and administered by the federal government, by state and federal governments, but also to the local and transnational sites of detention in which the majority of prison, prisoners are actually held, oftentimes before a trial and sometimes without formal charges. While there, while there is no single unifying logic amongst the, these tens of thousands of prisons, an overarching impact they all leave is the separation uh, from one's family and the suspension of one's citizenship. Whereas archives help instantiate and facilitate kinship and citizenship ties, the prison exists to ensure their erasure. So a closer examination of the particulars will illustrate each point. Prisons aim to prevent the cultivation of existing familial bonds while circumscribing and the creation of new ones. 
In some, prisons accomplish this by dramatically reducing the ability of families to remain in contact with incarcerated loved ones. Private companies such as Securus Technologies charge family members close to $2 for 20 minutes uh, of a phone call and even more for a video call. Such phone calls are even more essential amidst the contemporary landscape of prisons in which a person might be arrested in uh, one jurisdiction but then uh, convicted in another and incarcerated in yet another because of a private prison operator. So even for those persons who are not packaged and shipped uh, off-site, their family members face the toll of traversing to the remote locations uh, in which they are held, a story captured in the prologue of Ruth Wilson Gilmore's 2007 book, Golden Gulag. Even if one is able to reach the prison to visit someone who's incarcerated, the unchecked power of the prison guard can so dehumanize and traumatize a visitor that they may never return. Angela Davis notes in her 2003 book, Are Prisons Obsolete? The sexual violence that women prisoners endure via strip search. Yet the same violence is, exper is experienced uh, by uh, ostensibly free women who visit loved ones in prisons. So citing the need um, to, to screen for contraband, Prison officers can force women to remove their undergarments or require a Muslim woman to remove her hijab uh, for closer inspection. Oftentimes, this violence occurs in the view of children they've brought with them as well as in the sights of other families. So while the gendered violence of prison thus can be uh, an effective mode of family separation, um, it can also slow the growth of uh, new additions to families as well. For instance, the Eugenics Rubicon is a collaborative project of Jacqueline Wernermont and Alexandra Ministern that chronicles forced sterilization of thousands of people confined in California psychiatric institutions across the 20th century. The survivors of this eugenicist violence were overwhelmingly female and disproportionately Chicana. After the eugenics law was repealed in 1979, hundreds more women prisoners in California were offered sterilization immediately after giving birth while under heavy dosages of drugs to induce labor or alleviate pain. Another widespread means of population control by the prison is the reduction of states that allow conjugal visits, which provide a safe and intimate space for a couple to, re, uh, which provide a safe and intimate space for a couple to have sex or simply spend private time alone outside the immediate view of others. Um, of the few remaining states that even still have conjugal visits, just one of those states permits same-sex conjugal visits, which is another iteration of the violence exacted particularly against, the gay, against gay and lesbian lovers. So by enacting policies that prevent future family members from ever coming to existence, prisons thereby enact illegal, uh, if not unjust, means of forced birth control. And whereas archives actively obsess over the preservation of genealogical and sometimes bloodline connections, prisons function in the opposite direction as a structural severance of those ties. Of course, families and their incarcerated loved ones persist and they resist in creative ways, but the overall impact is clear. Fewer and weaker familial bonds uh, that are systematically eroded as well as barriers to birth uh, fresh ties. So the assault on kinship by the prison is surpassed only by its attack on citizenship. By stripping incarcerated people of fundamental human and democratic rights, prisons strive to make non-humans out of humans and non-citizens out of citizens. The American Studies scholar A. Naomi Pike classifies people held in U.S. prison camps as living with an indefinite rightslessness in which their basic rights as people to bring grievances and have them heard are nullified in the name of national security. Increasingly, this approach is commonplace in domestic jails and prisons as well. The poison water wells, such as the current case in Massachusetts at, at MIC, MCI Norfolk, Norfolk um, that has led to multiple deaths already. Um, the absence of air conditioning in South Carolina, which led to a huge series of prison riots and the lack of heating at the federal prison uh, right here uh, in Brooklyn, all typify um, the human and civil rights stripped of people held in US prisons. If you forget to shelter your pets during an emergency, you're more likely to be held accountable for their uh, death than um, in a prison administration who leaves behind incarcerated people during a weather emergency such as a hurricane or a tornado. So the process of prisoner uh, dehumanization preludes the revocation of rights afforded to those citizens. So people with prison sentences in 48 out of 50 states lose the right to vote during their incarceration, and in some states they lose it permanently. 
These voter suppression laws rode a wave of anti-prisoner legislation co-signed by both major political parties, mind you, um, and included such activities as the inability to form a political action committee or even to file a freedom of information request. That later, latter ability to have access to the records of a government uh, to create it in the context of, of government business that is so enshrined in American archival praxis is disallowed from uh, among many people doing time for felony convictions. So while prisons uh, enforce many other schemes of racist, sexist, and classist controls, it might be said that they additionally enforce a regime that seeks to break kinship ties and dissolve citizenship for people in prison. The mode of the prison's execution, which is long-term incarceration and the violence associated with it, it works to sever these large, uh, large, serve these larger ends as well, and when placed alongside archives, mark prisons as formative sites of unbelonging. Both sites constitute modalities of inclusion as well as exclusion, establishing who and who is not legitimate uh, beings before the eyes of the state. This is why, if you all remember a few years ago, the Library of Congress, uh, when they changed their subject description from illegal aliens to non-citizens, um, that actually reflected a more accurate um, summation of the penal logic. Much like family and citizens have to be made, uh, so too must non-families and non-citizens be made. So with the case that archives and prisons are at their essence about processes of belonging and unbelonging, how does that connect back to the conference theme of the politics and ethics of the archive? The conference description poses it perfectly. It reads in part, quote, how can archival material be put to use to draw attention to muted histories and otherwise invisible networks of affiliation and connection? The short answer is to read, learn from, and cite black women's work. That's the short answer. The longer answer is to imagine, create, or join projects that intentionally dislodge, disrupt, and offer insurgencies against the technologies of unbelonging that prisons in particular engender. The creation, publication, and distribution of documentation that resists the dehumanization of our carceral culture constitutes the, the crux of the archival matter. If I, as I have argued, archives are writ large uh, sites of belonging, it will follow then that they must be marshaled uh, to dismantle the systems and sites based on exclusion uh, from unbelonging. So there are two current archives um, that exemplify what this work looks like. The first example uh, is one that I learned of uh, through Twitter roughly two years ago and have been following ever since. Um, launched by the California Coalition for Women's Prisoners, A Living Chance is a project that gives voice to the muted histories that this conference seeks to reveal by uh, interweaving illustrating and detailing the lives of women serving life without parole or LWOP, prison sentences in California prisons. The general public and even mainstream prison reformers uh, tend to ignore these stories of women um, uh, who are serving LWOP for multiple reasons. First, these women are serving a death sentence, um, which um, LWOP in, uh, invariably is. Uh, LWOP is death by incarceration. So as opposed to death by execution, such as lethal injection or some other means, um, death by incarceration is less spectacular and more routine. Um, normally the people who die from death by incarceration are older people. Um, the, uh, and also these uh, uh, people who, are who, who suffer death by execution, ex uh, execution tend to be black women. So this means that the organizing energy required to struggle in solidarity with these women is um, typically uh, too much for politicians seeking to secure uh, a, a favorable soundbite during ele an election. So uh, the second reason is that these women were typically convicted of a violent crime, which again, many of the public and prison reformers are unwilling to face because to do so would acknowledge the conspiratorial confluence of sexist and racist violence that many women and, and genderqueer people face at the hands of intimate partners as well as police. So despite these realities, A Living Chance, and you can go on, it, on your phone or your tablet or computer at livingchance.com, um, it offers an intervention of how to infuse organizing campaigns with liberatory archival initiatives. In a space that reminds these women um, that of their unbelonging, their project is evidence of the ways in which archivists, abolitionists, and those gravitating towards both can build what the historian Kelly Lido Hernandez calls a rebel archive in her 2017 book, City of Inmates. The second project, uh, Testify, Storytelling for Change, constitutes another such rebel archive. 
Again, focusing on the impacts of incarceration on women as well as the families they lead, this archive elevates stories that are absent from the litany of programs, projects, and funding provided for boys and men escaping the tentacles of carcerality. Like a Living Chance, Testify, which again, you can just go online, testify.com, um, also sprang from an existing abolitionist organizing group that focuses on um, family, among other issues, family reunification. So uh, this larger abolitionist organization uh, focuses on the breakup of families, um, and represents a, which is a core tenet of the American prison enterprise. Thus, by identifying such a, a, a targeted topic such as family reunif reunification, the archive thus uplifts the stories of women from across a range of lifestyles, avoiding the seductive prison reformer trap of, uh, of ranking who's most deserving of care and tenderness. Particularly rebellious about testify is that it goes beyond providing stories of these women, which is a radical act on its own merit, and it also contains information um, about voting rights and a recent um, a legislative change in California that can aid women returning to the outside in um, accessing employment, housing, and other educational opportunities um, that, uh, that permeate people's uh, return from prison. So tes testify is a testament for how to deploy archives in an effort to reduce, uh, resist, and rupture the processes of unbelonging that pr prisons uh, perpetuate. So um, if you remember the short title of this talk, um, is graveyards of exclusion. And I want to close with proper attribution of its origins and consider what it means for us today. I first heard this phrase, graveyards of exclusion, from Derek Washington, a friend, a brother, an abolitionist, an intellectual, a reader, and an organizer with the Emancipation Initiative, a grassroots effort to end life without parole in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In addition to Derek's efforts with the Emancipation Initiative, he also gives his time uh, to the Harvard Prison Divestment Campaign as an external advisor. He does all of this work despite being held in captivity by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in uh, the Commonwealth Supermax Prison. In November, Derek delivered the keynote address, um, which we pre-recorded by phone, to a campus-wide forum convened by the Divestment Campaign. In the original recording of his speech, he poignantly described prisons as graveyards of exclusion. Unbeknownst to me, he removed that phrase out of the revised address that we played at Harvard. However, the phrase resonated with me because it names the stakes so clearly and convincingly. At risk are social and soon physical deaths that pile up in graveyards. An archivist with whom I formerly worked once said that archives are a type of death management work. She advised that archival repositories represent the documentary final resting places of a person's lived experiences. Both she and Derek are correct, in a sense. Archives manage lives after death, and prisons manage lives before death. The political and ethical endpoint of this claim should be obvious. If archivists care as much about families and citizenship as much as their websites, their publications, and their projects profess, then they would begin to see the prison as the ultimate rupture of those notions and envision their work as seminal in contesting these graveyards of exclusion. Nobody belongs in prison, and it's past time for archivists to press the boundaries of society to make this world possible. But to do so commands insurgent intentionality and an orientation to the work that, if practiced, brings us all to a more approximate version of freedom. That is the labor, and if we do it right, I believe that is also liberation. Thank you. Hi, Jared. That was an outstanding, thought-provoking discussion. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, one of the things that you stated really stuck with me when you said that it is within the archive that the subject becomes a citizen. So I want to just tease out a little bit with you the process of inclusion that we can make in terms of um, regranting citizenship to those who maybe have been um, removed from that and the role of community archiving in that process. Yep. Thank you for that question. Um, so there are um, actually one of the projects that I mentioned, um, uh, the second one, Testify, Storytelling for Change. Um, they provide a very interesting model of how to, to go about uh, doing that. One example that they talk about is um, taking advantage of um, legislative changes that allow certain past criminal records to be expunged. 
um, which allows people to have greater access to the basic services such as housing, um, health care, and other kinds of essential services they need. So I know that that's sometimes like a little backwards from what we think of archives, like we think of of um, grassroots archival efforts as necessarily producing more documentation, but sometimes what people need is to be uh, free from particular records that follow them into like employment and job interviews and follow them into, into applications for school. Um, so that's just, that's just one example. Um, another would be um, there's a, been a lot of discussion recently about archives for um, undocumented uh, people in, in the United States and like what's the, uh, on one hand, how to balance the need for protection, um, again, as highlighted on the last panel, um, from government agencies, but also how to ensure uh, inter intergenerational memory. Um, so I think some of the, the projects that were described in the last panel provide excellent, excellent examples of how to do that balance with, um, with, delig with diligence um, and respect for what, what people want to, to be transmitted to future, to future generations. So, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, when you were talking about Rubicon, um, one thing, um, perhaps, have you done any work with um, indigenous women? Because a lot of indigenous women in the 70s, right, were forced to have sterilization within prisons. So that was one question I had. And then I also wanted to ask you if you could maybe talk a little bit more about how you see yourself as a laboratory memory worker in terms mm -hmm. of the work you've done inside. Yeah. Um, so the first question, I have not. Um, the eugenics Rubicon, I was on the advisory board uh, when it first started, so I didn't have any engagement with the actual um, people who were, who were forced to be serialized. My main job was to provide guidance to the researchers um, at Michigan and Arizona State on how they should go about ethically um, keeping those stories in. Um, they actually decided not to publish them online, so if you search for the eugenics Rubicon and you go to the website, um, you won't find any kind of personally identifiable information. Um, about the people who were forced to be sterilized. Um, so the second part about the liberatory memory work and going inside, I think the direction that I'm drifting towards is um, uh, paying close attention to the, uh, some of the example projects that I gave to um, give um, essentially a microphone in front of the faces of people uh, whose voices are otherwise silenced. Um, so one specific example is um, I'm collaborating with some people from the Emancipation Initiative and Derek um, and others on the bill to uh, restore voter rights uh, to people who are inside. And um, when I started, when they asked me to be on this project, I was like, I don't know nothing about voting rights or like campaigning or anything like that. But I realized that one thing that I could contribute was to the idea of how to build the narratives of the people uh, who are advocating for voting rights, what kinds of um, compelling um, archival resources uh, could be created, whether you're talking about life histories, whether you're talking about any other kinds of, of content creation. So um, I'm shifting more towards like memory work projects that have a, a more, um, I don't wanna say immediate impact, but I, I'm trying to move away from thinking of archives as being kept for future generations because of the simple fact that I don't know that we're gonna have a planet Earth uh, for future generations to be around. So I think that uh, we're in desperate need of, of liberatory memory work that kind of like bends the notion of like a space and time. So that's, that's one example and there are a few other projects I'm working on like that. Thank you so much, Jarrett, for your incredible writing and all that you're doing to shape archivists now and archivists in the future. Um, I have a question, but I just wanna make a quick comment. Um, the first collection I ever processed was historical um, court records that involved inventorying um, individuals, their addresses, um, counties, and of course, the quote-unquote crimes that they committed. And I was 20 years old, and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do it, you know, this is my job. Um, but I was so uncomfortable with it because I have family members who have been incarcerated and whose records are um, publicly available online, right? Like their mug shots, their court dates, um, all that information, and not being able to reconcile that um, for many years um, until your point now of saying that there's this moment where archivists are um, becoming liberatory workers alongside mass incarceration and so on. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. My question um, is what has your experience been like in working with prison officials um, perhaps, I guess, with your thesis, 
um, in acquiring records, I'm so haunted by um, your line of how solitary confinement um, correlates with retention scheduling. So what, what was that experience like? Um, so uh, just to respond to your comment, like I absolutely like if I could retweet it right now, like I would retweet it because I had similar experiences with people inside. Um, some people who um, I, I chose to focus on family in this talk because I had family who uh, were incarcerated that I didn't even know they were incarcerated. I just like sort of slowly drifted away um, and then eventually like going to their funerals or like seeing news clippings about them uh, uh, being murdered. So um, to, to work on, on like the memory side of, of this uh, is, is very, uh, it, it can be a lot. So uh, my advice would just be to, to be sure to, to take, take care of yourself. Um, and that's part of why I continue to do the work I do. Um, to, the, to the second question, I mean, to the second part of your comment, the question about, um, if you, sorry, I just blanked on the second part of your question. <laughs> it was a long, what was your experience like in going oh. to prisons and acquiring these records from these officials directly? So it actually was a lot, it, it was a lot, um, I, I, let me say this, I went with the expectation, especially the parchment uh, in Mississippi, that like there's gonna be these old, white male like CEOs and they would be like chewing tobacco and shit and like you know calling me slurs actually most of the people who worked at the uh, state uh, penitentiary in Mississippi at the time were black uh, most of them were women most of them like had master's degrees so actually the ability to like relate with them was very easy um, and it really kind of threw me off and I remember my advisor David Wallace saying to me um, not to go into a research site um, to, with the like expectation of what people are gonna be like. Um, these were very normal, regular people. Some of them seemed like, like my mother, some of them seemed like my auntie, some of them seemed like my cousins. Um, so they were actually very willing to like let me in. I think that had to do with, at the time, they had a black man who was the head of the Mississippi Department of Corrections. So he was, um, I met him when he came to Michigan for a talk, and he said he would, he would look out for me. So. Um, I don't know if in today's landscape it would be that easy, but sometimes you just like get lucky, and um, that was that was definitely one of those times. Thank you for a beautiful talk um, and very insightful and thought provoking. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more of, about you know the sort of where you ended um, about this question of collapsing temporality which I think is a very interesting one. Um, I've been thinking, and it's one that, you know, I've been thinking about quite a bit, like that the idea of archiving as a way of documenting the past for the future, mm -hmm. um, which is really kind of contingent on a model of the archive that is not just familially based, mm -hmm. I think it's a really good point, but also, you know, as the sort of evidence mm -hmm. for the future. So there's a kind of implied both past pastness and futurity to the archive, mm -hmm. but I'm actually more interested <laughs> in um, this idea of um, envisioning revolutionary and liberatory projects that disrupt that pastness and future, which is, a, a, you know, I've called it in the past a col colonizing trick, yep. right, which yep. is that you know, the idea that to, to be an archive or to count as an archive, you have to be institutionalized, you have to be acknowledged or recognized by the institution, you know, um, and there's all these ephemeral projects that are not true archives, mm -hmm. right? And yet the conditions, it's like citizenship is a colonizing trick, the conditions, mm -hmm. like you can never meet them. Mm -hmm. You will never be a part of the archive, so you can never be an archive given its own definition. Um, but there's this, thing that you mentioned, which was this idea of disrupting that relationship between the pre present, past, and future of the archive as an institutional arm of power mm -hmm. that these other kinds of projects are engaging. So I just wanted to hear more about that. Yeah, um, I, I'll give credit to uh, an article I read in my uh, program last year. It was The article was titled The Time of Slavery by Sadia Hartman. And I remember in that piece, she talks about how for uh, black people across the diaspora, this idea of like when the violence like ended is like a non-starter because for black people, 
uh, in the world, like there's like not an end in sight to the violence, right? So um, I, she's talking uh, specifically about the Middle Passage, but I think uh, whether you're talking about police violence, you're talking about cycles of incarceration, um, I think that those all rely on a linear idea of time. And that's the way, honestly, that a lot of like archivists are trained and educated to think about um, records and, and think about an archival enterprise. They're trained to think about like this event happened, here's a, a transaction of that event, um, this event um, and the records about it get come into the archive and in the future someone is going to come uh, and look back at that event and like then the cycle is going to repeat. Um, and I think that the uh, trauma and violence that people of color have endured in the Americas uh, signify that that l mode of linear time doesn't doesn't work. So um, yeah, I, I think that, um, and, and that's something that I only arrived at once I left the archive. Like when I was still working, um, and, you know, for instance, with the project in Cleveland, I was still very much thinking about like, uh, okay, like when did this event happen? Like where did it happen? And, and trying to like plot this kind of like template. And I think that um, uh, the emergence of archives that complicate that and, and um, distort time are, are the, the most revolutionary. I think it gives black people places to hide from the violence. Um, I think it, it gives us spaces to stay safe. Um, so yeah, I, I really hope that more and more uh, practicing archivists um, think about how the, the uh, colonial view of time as like an event happens and then there's a record of it. Uh, I hope that they uh, begin to complicate that notion because it, it helps uh, at the end of the day um, reaffirm existing power dynamics and inequalities. Thank you so much for your talk. I, um, there was something that stuck out a lot for me um, because in, in my talk I, I opened it speaking about how in the Virgin Islands we're a community that um, has kind of effectively lost our archives and that relationship to our lack of full citizenship in the United States but definitely um, it definitely also reflected our lack of being seen as a political body when Denmark chose mm -hmm. to sell us without thinking about the political rights of the people that were there and how the archives were then taken away. But what I find interesting is, you know, the, the U.S. Virgin Islands have yet to write their own constitution. Mm -hmm. um, we've tried five times. And one of the things that keeps getting caught up is this idea of what is a Virgin Islander mm -hmm. um, and how the archives relate to that. Because mm -hmm. what ends up happening is you talked about this idea of um, a colonial idea of time is that we look back to 1917 when we were transferred from one colonial power to another and that disruption that happened as a marker to create a new Virgin Islander mm -hmm. and as a marker to create an ancestral Virgin Islander. And so when we tried to write our own constitution, there was a creation of that term which keeps getting rejected. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess for me, starting off this with my thoughts, I'm really curious about this relationship between archive, citizenship, um, the coloniality of thinking about time, and just if you had any thoughts about our conundrum. <laughs> yeah, um, I've, I've heard about that case before, actually from a, a few anthropologists. Um, and uh, ostensibly the way that like the West has tried to um, tell people you become citizens is you have to have some documentary evidence of it, right? So like now there's all this talk about like people keeping them papers on them, even if they are quote unquote a legitimate citizen. Like I, my argument would be that if you're black, you can never be a legitimate citizen in a white settler colonial society. So like um, part part of it is is um, a, a recognition that like the the limitation of um, the archive as uh, that purports itself to be one about like enfranchising more people. Hey, come get naturalized and get a passport or get a X, Y, Z, but always realizing that it's literally just a piece, piece of paper. And once, you know, a, a great example of this, um, uh, also in the Caribbean has to do with the Dominican Republic um, revoking the, the citizenship of, of uh, people born and raised in that country who couldn't prove that their grandparents were born in that country. What that essentially uh, said, and gets to, to the point you're raising, is that um, if you can't like bring forth some documentary evidence to say that you belong here, you're gonna get kicked out. And they have since deported um, uh, uh, large, amounts of, large amounts of people. So I think that um, what um, most interests me about projects that like kind of try to evade the the colonial structure of like keeping records is that 
you can like kind of in a way, um, you know, reinvent, like all of these like, identities are reinvented. Like I think as you were talking, I was thinking about um, the new Negro movement um, across the Americas in the, in the 1920s. Like these were literally people who were like, you know what, we need a new identity. Like we used to be this and we, we've, you know, gotten certain kinds of civil rights, but those civil rights, of course, didn't mean shit. When people came back from the war, they, they were lynched in their uniforms. So it's like this kind of like idea of how do we cultivate through the arts, through culture, through music, through food, a sort of new, new way of being, I think is, um, has more, more resonance than sometimes what, what documents um, are able to provide. I kind of, honestly, at this point, hate the idea of documents. I, I don't think that they do anything unless they are activated uh, for, for liberatory and insurgent work. The presentation was highly informative, and you gave uh, the population of the people who were incarcerated in prison, mainly adults. But you spoke of the intimate spaces where partners could get together. And basically, there are creations taking place. Mm -hmm. And children, infants, are born in prison. I'm wondering if you saw anything in the archives where that stigma of where they were born is impacting where how they participate in in, in, in public, in school, basically, because you have to have an address, mm -hmm. and a lot of the addresses of kids coming into the public school system now, is, uh, they're in Brooklyn, but they were born in Bedford, mm -hmm. a huge prison up there. Right. So your presentation talked about the archives, but I don't, I didn't hear any type of acknowledgement of those people, those infants, who are born into that system, and I'm wondering if there's going to be a type of stigma that will follow them throughout because of their address. Mm. Um, yeah, your, your observation is spot on. That was a, a, an oversight on, on my part. Um, I'm not as familiar with the records of like juveniles, um, I just because I haven't or infants, I haven't worked with them, so I can't, I can't speak to it. I would presume, though, that uh, having been a, a public school teacher, that it definitely does impact like all kinds of things in terms of, like residency and, um, and things of that nature, but I'm personally just un, under-informed about it, so I, uh, that's the only thing I can really say is I, it's something for me to learn about more, and um, I would love to read anything that anybody has to suggest on it. I'm going to take the privilege of the chair to say thank you so much for a really, really moving and provocative talk. And thanks to everyone here who's made it to the end. You get a reward. There's a reception and more conversation. So thanks, everybody, for a great day. Thank you.